Hi everyone and welcome to an another insightful session with Sustainable Times. My name is Chloe Wooden and I am here with Mudge, the visionary founder of Rocket Phone AI, formerly known as Voice IQ. As we know, Rocket Phone is making waves in the ethical voice AI domain. So today we're going to delve deep into the journey, mission and vision of Rocket Phone. So Mitch, to start off, can you walk us through the early days of Rocket Phone AI and so what inspired you to venture into the voice AI industry? Um, I think there, there are a number of factors to that. I, I think, um, you know, with all these things, it's all about timing and planets having to come into alignment in order for an opportunity to present itself um, in a way that it can be um, sort of acted upon um, in a way that's going to deliver some sort of a return. So, so for me, it was, um, I'd spent 11 years at salesforce.com. I was there in the early days. I'd helped to build a business um, in, in the UK and, and latterly in Europe as well. And in all that time, um, I spent a lot of my days speaking with voice vendors, telephony vendors, you know, all the big, I'm not going to mention the names, but all, all the big names that you might have heard of. And, and, and the one that occurred to me was that um, all these companies, um, they hadn't moved on. If you look at every other industry, you know, all the industrial revolutions and what we see in the technology space, there's been a huge amount of movement and innovation progression, right? So, you know, we see um, in the 80s, you had these desktop computers and very quickly they became laptop computers and very quickly they became tablets and mobiles. And, and now, like the phone that you have in your pocket is probably a thousand times more powerful than million dollar supercomputer from back in the late 70s. So, you know, we've seen huge amounts of progress uh, in the tech space. But interestingly, you know, people think voice and telephony is tech, right? Because it's, it's a gadget, it's a device, there's infrastructure, there's signals and all that sort of stuff. But the reality is that if you look at modern telephony, um, a very little has happened to it in the last 100 years. So 100 years ago, you can make a call, you can receive a call, right? And really, if you look at your phone application on your Android or your um, iPhone, um, it's doing the same thing. You're making calls, you're receiving calls. If you want to send a text, you have to come out and go into a separate application, your SMS app or your WhatsApp um, application. So, 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 so the way I saw the industry was, you know, the, there's a huge amount of pent up opportunity um, in this industry. And, you know, f famously, if you, if you, you know, speak to, uh, you know, all, all the big CEOs like Bill Gates and, you know, late, uh, the late Steve Jobs. The, the one thing they always say about startups is that, you know, pick an industry that is ripe for disruption that presents a trillion dollar opportunity. And that's voice and telephony, because if you look at the state of that market, it, it's just stuck in this sort of status quo situation where people accept what they have and, and they don't really think beyond um, what, it, you know, what is currently um, what is currently in front of them. And, and uh, so, so the market was in, in just the right place. Uh, the other things were the you know, factors around um, access to high uh, speed internet, um, the fact that we're generating tons of data, more data than we've ever generated before, um, and access to you know, ever decreasing compute power. You put those things together um, and then you apply those things, uh, those sort of micro changes to a market that is um, stagnant. And, and, and there's a huge amount of opportunity there. So th that's the first phase. The next phase is how do I then take this huge opportunity and, and, and materialize it and do something with it? And that's kind of where Rocket Phone really, really came in. Yeah, amazing. That's really interesting sort of hearing how Rocket Phone came to life. But along that journey, did you find that there were many challenges along the way that you sort of had to overcome? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, where do I begin? Right. Um, so I, I think for, like, you know, for any young company, um, the biggest thing is, um, especially in the tech space, you know, people think we're in the business of software, right? We're not. We're actually in the business of innovation, right? You know, we live and breathe um, innovation that is, you know, dramatic change that can have a sweeping impact um, globally. Because if, if you're not thinking about your technology and the impact of it globally, you don't really have a tech business, right? What you have is, you know, I don't know, what do you call them, like a casual sort of operation where, you know, you, you might be writing software for one company versus the other. Um, if you want to have a serious software company, uh, then you need to have global ambition. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so there is there are so many challenges, <laughs> right? 
um, f for any young company, uh, especially especially in the uh, in the tech space. So the, the, the number one challenge that any um, startup is going to face, especially in tech, is, is access to people, right? Um, because everyone presumes that you know, oh, they're in the software business, they're in the tech business, they're in this infrastructure business. We're not, right? We're in the business of innovation, okay? So whenever we create product or technology, it has to be innovative and it has to have the potential to have broad impact across the world, right? Because if you're not thinking about your technology or your software from a global perspective, you don't really have a software business, right? You know, the world shrunk um, when the internet took off. So we can run an operation based out of the UK and we could be sending our software to people in North America uh, on the same day we could be sending to people in Australia, in the Americas, across Asia Pacific, wherever it, you know, we need to sell our product, we can sell our product because, you know, everything exists in the cloud, everything is, um, you know, is accessible. And, and so what you need to deliver that is really, really smart people. And, and the problem with smart people is that they're really expensive. Um, so on, on the one hand, you know, as a young company, you're looking to raise money um, early on. And, and when you're raising money early on, you don't have anything to raise against. All you have is like your name and your reputation, right? And you've got a PowerPoint presentation deck. And, and, and there are, you know, thankfully there are schemes in place, particularly in the UK, where there's tax efficiencies and stuff like that offered by the government to encourage people with uh, extra money to, to invest in companies like ours because it's companies like, our, like ours that sort of establish themselves, grow, and, and then propel the UK economy, right? So, so, so th those things aside, people are still expensive. And, and so I had to figure out a way of getting access to, to, to the best talent um, in the space that we're in without spending a fortune, right? And, and so the way we did that was um, we, we know that um, the best talent for AI, um, and, and, for, um, uh, and, and, and for software research in general uh, can be found in the best universities, right? And, and in the UK, there's two universities that sort of, you know, top of the list there, University of Manchester and Oxford University. So, so we spent a lot of time with those two universities, um, developing partnerships with them, getting very close to them because, you know, with that level of relationship, we're in a position where, you know, they have the smartest AI minds doing AI PhDs and, you know, we get to recruit them before they get you know, hired by a bank in the city earning 400 grand a year. Uh, so th th that, was, that was the major challenge, right? And how do we you know, create a, a sustainable um, a recruitment model so, so that we can continually have access to the best people um, to drive the innovation that we need to deliver in order for our business to be successful? And uh, am I correct in saying you work very closely with the head of AI at Oxford University? Mm -hmm. um, he's part of Rocket Phone. Is he is indeed, yeah, yeah, Professor yeah. Michael Waldridge who you can see on the telly this Christmas because he's doing the, uh, the National Institute Christmas lectures this year. Uh, I used to watch them growing up, fascinating. So, so he's doing that. And I think AI is like the major theme uh, for the Christmas lectures this year. But yeah, uh, Professor Michael Baldridge is um, head of computer science at Oxford University. He's also chairman of the Turing Institute. Um, he's in a whole, he, he spent the best part of his career uh, on AI. And, and the thing with the AI is people talk about it now as, as it's like a new thing. The, the technology and the techniques have been around for decades. It's just recently, um, as I mentioned before, you know, the access to compute power, access to data, those things have made AI-based applications more feasible. So, so what we have is one of the, literally one of the world's top brains on artificial yeah. intelligence, and he's our chief science officer. Yeah, that's amazing that you've got that connection. Yeah. I mean, I think that goes on to my next question, sort of how has Rocket Phone AI evolved since it's, sort of inception as voice IQ? Okay, yeah, really good question. Um, so we've been around for slightly over four years now. And, uh, you know, the, the, the thing with any startup is uh, right at the beginning, it's everything sort of very sort of fuzzy and high risk. You're not quite sure where you're going with, you know, with the business and uh, you have a vision and, and you're desperately trying to keep that vision afloat. You know, it's, it's like being in a, a rowing boat that's constantly filling with water. Um, and, and, and it's quite hard at the beginning. Um, and, and so in, in the first year, you know, we spent an awful lot of time just like, recruiting the right people, being very selective about who we bring on board because um, you know, the, the, the first 10 people that you hire have a massive downstream impact on, on what your company does going forward um, because the culture, um, the attitude, the vision, um, the level of original thinking, all that sort of stuff um, hinges very much upon who the first 10 hires are. So we, we spent a lot of time just making sure that we got the best people and that that hiring process took me the best part of the year because I wanted to get it right. Uh, because you get it wrong and then it's just, you know, it, it's, it's disastrous potentially. 
Um, so we started, you know, we, we built our first product um, uh, around 20, at the end of 2019, started 2020. Um, and we launched that um, very quietly because we wanted to, to go out to a select small number of companies just so we can get the feedback and trial it and kind of improve it. Um, but what we've seen is like a massive acceleration in, in, in the pace of development of our, of our platform. So, you know, there are things that we're doing today that there isn't a company on the planet that is even thinking about doing today. Um, there are things that we're doing today that um, even if they thought about doing it, um, they perhaps don't have the capability or the skills or the knowledge or the insights or the background to deliver those things. And, and, and this is going back to hiring the right people and having these strong and, and deep connections with Oxford and the University of Manchester. You know, when we, when we solve remarkably difficult problems, right? These are really hard problems. And, and, and you know, by solving these problems, we, we are creating um, a system um, and an environment in, in which we can have dramatic change um, across the world and have dramatic impact. This is what we're all about. As we're not a software company. We're all about innovation, change, and, and transformation. Um, so, you know, we, we have these amazing people building amazing things. And I can give you some examples. You yeah, know. I was going to say, tell us more about the problems that sort of you can yeah. solve using sort of Rocket Phone. Yeah, so we, we work very closely. One of the... Uh, I mean, one of the really amazing things that happened uh, around the end of 2020 was the government, UK government gave us uh, half a million pounds uh, to, to work on some very challenging societal problems. And, and one of the biggest societal problems that we see right now uh, is the aging population. Um, healthcare is fantastic. Um, people are living for much longer. Um, but the consequence of that is that we're seeing uh, an increased prevalence of age-related illnesses like dementia, aphasia, RHD. Um, so the, the second societal problem is that tech is moving so quickly that it's just really, really hard to keep on top of like what's happening out there, uh, you know, out there in the world. And I've, I've got a, a seven-year-old, right? And, and uh, it's, it's, it's bonkers. Um, if you look at my LinkedIn, you know, we did a school run and he's asking me about software compilers and how to create machine code and stuff like that. He's seven years old and, and he's sitting there and he's learned how to code in Python. Um, and, and, you know, I would never conceive of a child having that level of understanding. He's not unique. Like, you know, it's just um, they grow up in a world um, where they take social media for granted. They take, um, you know, any form of technology for granted. And, and the problem with that is, you know, if you're, um, if you're not in the tech sector yourself beyond a certain age, there's a huge, huge risk of um, having that position abused, right? Um, so what we're seeing um, increasingly are way more fraud attempts, people calling up, um, you know, banks or insurance companies or pension funds purporting to be um, a client of theirs and having funds, you know, transferred and, or, and, and, and then you know, even directly calling vulnerable people and, and trying to, you know, sort of get money out of them using dishonest means. And, and, and that societal problem is going to, it's just going to keep getting worse uh, because the pace of change with tech is just it's just really hard to keep up uh, and even like sometimes I struggle um, and even I've had emails you know, where it just looks really convincing um, and I have to dig into it to figure out that it's actually you know l like a fraud attempt so, so you know there's a lot of opportunity uh, using voice AI to address these sorts of problems um, and, and so you know we built AI um, that can do amazing things like you know we can detect whether somebody has a mental health issue so you're having a conversation um, with, with a sales rep at a big insurance company. That big insurance company um, is required by the FCA in the UK or whoever the regulatory board is in whatever country, North America has their board, Australia, Canada have theirs, etc. And, and they're required to treat vulnerability in a very specific way. So you know, if I call up and I start mumbling and umming and ahhing and it looks like I may have um, some sort of mental health challenge, they're required to stop the conversation don't sell to this person because this person could be vulnerable and he said, take the conversation down this path. The trouble is, um, even, even the best managed, organ best managed organizations with the best will in the world will miss vulnerability because it's very hard to train every sales rep or every customer service rep on how to, you know, how to sort of detect these things. And especially in contact centers, people are coming and going all the time. There's a lot of throughput. You know, sometimes they're um, working during, during their university holidays and, and, and they go back to university. Other times they're there because they need to get a foot in the door for, for their careers. They stick around for a year or two, they move on to the next role. Very, very hard to train people consistently on detecting vulnerability. So we built technology with the help of the UK government, working with Oxford University and the University of Manchester. Um, and, and we can detect things like somebody's approximate age. So if I receive a call 
and I'm a big bank and this person says, hi, I'm John Smith, I want to transfer some of my balance from here to there. Uh, we know from the customer management system or from the CRM system that this person is 65 years old, but the person calling in signs 25. Hmm. You know, let, let's raise an alarm bell, okay? Um, now, now imagine a scenario where you, know, you have an elderly grandparent or an uncle who's living by themselves and, and, and you know, they're at home all day and, and they're at the mercy of what's on TV and the inbound phone calls that they're getting and, and someone gets a phone call uh, and they claim to be their bank manager or their fund manager at, at their pension fund, and, uh, but it's not. And, and this person is vulnerable because they're by themselves. They don't really understand how these things work sometimes. And uh, people just take advantage and, and they will, you know, and, and they will commit acts of fraud um, at the detriment of these vulnerable people. Um, imagine an AI that can detect that and stop it in its tracks or raise alarm bells or notify the police or just hang up the conversation before the crime can take place. So those are the sort of far reaching um, societal problems that we are addressing um, with Rocket Phone. Does that give yeah, you some examples? No, I think, you know, I can really relate to that as I, I, I have family members that that has happened to before. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's becoming more and more common nowadays that you receive a phone call that sounds exactly like your bank or it's so clever and, and to, to know that you've created this technology which is going to solve sort of so many problems um, is really amazing. So, so well done for that. Yeah. I mean... Let's go more into sort of what would you feel like is your biggest accomplishment with Rocket Phone? Okay. That's so we're bit. going from the challenges, how you've overcome them, and what is your sort of biggest accomplishment? I, I think there are, you know, there are so many moments where you, you sit back and you feel proud of the team, and it's like picking out which is the best of those moments. It's very hard to pick one amongst all of them. Um, I think, for, you know, for me personally, um, from a company perspective, getting our first customer was a massive personal massive it, it wasn't a massive commercial win there wasn't like tons of money in it but it was a massive personal win because um what people don't realize very often is that you know they see company ceos at the tail end of you know the company's sort of um, journey you know they've made it um they've got tons of customers they might have gone ipo they might have even sold the company right mm -hmm. and, and that's when the ceo gets the most attention because you're in the news, there's media attention on your IPO or whatever it might be. What a lot of people don't see is that all the struggle and the pain and the hardship that you have to go through at the beginning. And um, we, we, we make a lot of assumptions, right? And um, as much as possible, we're trying to leap into um, something with as much foresight as possible, right? But at the end of the day, the very nature of what we do, being innovation, is that you're creating something that never existed before. And, and, and you're making lots of assumptions about whether the world wants this or whether the world needs this. And, um, and you're never quite sure. And, and you tell everybody that the world needs this. You're convinced the world needs this. You've done all the research. You've asked lots of customers. You've spoken to the general public. And you have the data that tells you that the world needs this. But then the back of your mind is still thinking, what if, what if they don't? Yeah. Um, and, and, and that is, frankly, the death knell of, of many, many startups. You know, they get to a point and they realize they've, they've created a, um, a solution to a problem that doesn't exist. Yeah. And, and for me, uh, when Prudential came on board as our first customer... I was just going to go into that. Let's yeah. talk about who was that first customer. It was Prudential. Yeah. It was uh, one of the world's biggest life insurance wealth management companies. Um, absolutely huge. And uh, it wasn't just the fact that you know, it was the logo. Um, it was a lot of validation for us because th that sale... Uh, I I've worked in software sales for last couple of decades, right? And um, so, so I have some experience of like carrying uh, a product to a, you know, through a sales process. Well, um, you've, you've got a great background, haven't you? You've sort of run companies, uh -huh. um, successfully acquired companies, yep. um, yeah, Salesforce. So it'll be great to sort of delve more into that as well in terms of how you feel like your background has sort of made you into who you are today and also going into sort of how, with Prudential, how did you get in sort of that connection? Mm -hmm. well, well, one of the advantages of having been in the industry for a couple of decades, well, more than a couple of decades, um, uh, but also being as old as I am, <laughs> is that um, you build up a network of people that you know. Uh, and and I'm, I'm a great believer in relationship. Um, there's a taxi firm that I use to get me to the airport, and it's the same taxi firm that I've used for the last 30 years. 
And even if they charge me more, I'll, I'll still use the same taxi firm because I know that the relationship is such that they'll always show up on time and they'll get me to my um, flight on time. So, um, so, so there are people that I know that it goes back decades. And, and so I, I called a few people and I said, um, look, I'm, I'm thinking of launching this company. Uh, I'm going to leave salesforce.com to do it. Um, and if, if you've ever watched that Kevin Costa movie, The Field of, Field of Dreams, um, you know, if you're as old as I am, you probably have. If you're much younger, you probably haven't. It was a great movie. I highly recommend it. Um, it's all about, you know, he wants to build a great big uh, baseball stadium. And, and there are ghosts in the field that tell him if you build it, they will come. So it's a massive leap of faith on his part. And his wife is behind him all the way. And, and he builds a stadium. And, and in the end, it becomes, I I've given the game away with the movie, but it, it's really <laughs> successful. Um, so so I, I, I called these guys. And one of the folks that I called was the um, a very senior person um, in the Prudential. And uh, he said, you know, what you're describing is actually uh, really interesting because uh, it's something that we genuinely could use. Um, so why don't you come in and, and show us and, and tell us what, what you can't show us, you haven't built anything yet, but tell us what you plan to do. So th they became um, not just our customer, but um, a sort of co-research partner. And part of the reason we were able to build Rocket Phone so quickly um, and build it um, in, in a way where you are solving genuine problems that companies are willing to pay for is because um, Prudential came on board as, as our first customer. So th that, that was, uh, I'm very proud of that. Uh, also very proud of um, the fact that there's a company called Twilio um, who is the world's biggest cloud telephony company. They're bigger than BT, bigger than Vodafone, bigger than all those guys. They're based in San Francisco, um, in California. Um, you know, proper Silicon Valley success story, worth billions upon billions. Um, they run a competition for startups. Um, this was a couple of years ago now. And um, they had around 10,000 applications for that. We, we were one of those. And uh, we came fourth um, out of those people, out, out of those companies. Now, fourth doesn't sound like something to be proud of. It's almost like you lost. <laughs> but um, the guys that won, you know, they were massively well-funded Silicon Valley companies with huge amounts of cash. Um, they had the inside track with uh, Twilio, the competition organizer. So they were already known to them. And we were just this like completely unknown company that, you know, out there in the sticks of the United Kingdom, um, in, in a little town that these guys never heard of because they're all based in Silicon Valley, yeah. who were sort of like, you know, muscling in on, on, on the Silicon Valley action. And we came forth and it was just a massive, massive achievement for us. Um, and again, it, it's, it, it's not just the winning, it's also the, the validation that you get from that. It's, you know, um, as a CEO, I've just like brought in all these investors Right, and, and investors need to understand this. The sheer amount of responsibility I feel towards every penny invested is, is extraordinarily hard for me to explain. I, I lie awake at night, you know, thinking about how quickly can I get a return for these guys because without these guys, nothing would have happened, yeah. right? So, 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 you know, when, when you win these competitions, when you get these first customers, it, it gives you a sense of peace, right? That we're on the right track, yeah. right? I can go back to my investors. And I can confidently and, and, and genuinely say to them, you know, we're on the right path. Yeah. Um, and it's good momentum for everybody. Definitely. I think they're great achievements and sort of exactly going back to that, you know, that feeling of you've accomplished it and it's working. And mm -hmm. am I incorrect in saying you've implemented it into Salesforce? Um, sort of where else has, it, has the system been implemented? So, so we've integrated our products into Salesforce. Yeah. Um, so we have a relationship with Salesforce. So yeah. Um, it, 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 our relationship with Salesforce is deeper hmm. than it would be uh, than if they were a customer of ours. They are actually incentivized to sell our product. Okay. So a Salesforce sales rep, and there's 20,000 of them around the world, um, can sell our product if they spot a gap or an opportunity um, for a voice AI, AI-based telephony, that kind of thing. Hmm. So um, we're very, very close. And you would expect that, right? I spent 11 years yeah. there. So, um, so, so we work very close with Salesforce. Um, that, that doesn't mean uh, that Salesforce is, you know, exclusively the only company that we work with. Yeah. Um, I've had a number of uh, pretty senior level conversations. Um, you know, um, I spent a couple of hours with the head of enterprise at Vodafone Business Systems. Um, I spent time with the CEO of, of Genesis, which is the world's biggest contact center technology company. Um, he's also the chap that um, created Skype, which you may have heard of. And he sold it to Microsoft for $3 billion, wow. uh, which we, at the time, we thought, how did you even come close to any billion, let alone three billions? But anyway, um, and, and he's a CEO of Genesis. So he spent a lot of time with me, and I've spoken about what we're doing. And, you know, he likes what we do. 
Um, I met with the, um, uh, the head of um, application innovation at Microsoft. Um, and we have a dialogue um, uh, active right now. And, um, and, and part of the reason for having these conversations is that, yes, my background is Salesforce. Um, but my background is also, you know, I, I spent uh, a number of years as a research scientist at IBM. Um, I spent time at um, one of the biggest software companies in the world, a company called Oracle. Um, I've been through a couple of startups and we sold them both. Um, this be my third startup. So, you know, um, we, we need to be um, balanced uh, as, a, uh, as, as a tech company, and as a startup company. We need to have alliances with, with the right companies, but we also have to keep our options open um, because it may not be this company that wants to acquire us. It might be this other company, you know, and, and we have to keep those options open as well. So, you know, we are getting recognized, we're getting noticed. Um, and, and we're speaking to, you know, s some pretty senior people, hard hitters in the industry. Yeah, amazing. Okay, so let's go more into the mission and vision of Rocket Phone. So at the heart of Rocket Phone lies an ethical commitment. Yeah. So can you explain the significance of this ethos and how it sets you apart in the voice AI landscape? Absolutely, yeah. So um, w we all know there's a massive commercial opportunity in voice AI. We know that, it's a given. I mean, AI companies are worth, you know, billions upon billions, um, you know, uh, and, and they're being acquired for hundreds of millions. They're raising money against valuations of, you know, multiple billions. It's just, it's just a crazy, crazy world out there. And, and so we know that there's a very strong commercial opportunity there. The other thing I know is that um, I've been to two exits, and, and the question you have to ask yourself as a CEO is, like, you know, what do you actually leave behind, right? Um, so it, it's with the right resources, the right people, the right level of investment, um, it's almost a foregone conclusion that you could create a billion dollar company, right? Um, the last company that we built up and sold sold for 400 million. So going from 400 million, um, and there was no AI frenzy then, and that was a voice AI company. Today, there is an AI frenzy. Again, we have another voice AI company. Could that be worth 400 million? Could it be, could it be worth a billion? Could it be worth more, right? Um, but put that to one side, you know, the real question is, what do you leave behind? And, and what is the impact that you've had? And has it been, have you left any positive outcome in your wake, right? So when, when we created Rocket Phone, um, the same that day that we created, it, it used to be called Voice IQ, right? So the day that we created Voice IQ, now known as Rocket Phone. We also created what we call um, the Voice IQ, now the Rocket Phone Foundation, okay? So we pledged to, we knew that the tech we were gonna build was gonna be um, multifaceted. On the one hand, it's gonna deliver huge amounts of value to commercial organizations. So we know that if you can detect vulnerability and, and stop mis-selling and all that sort of stuff, we can help companies like Barclays and, and uh, Morgan Stanley and all these companies, big financial institutions, we can help them save hundreds of millions of pounds a year um, in, in fines, right? If you look at the FCA website and you go to the fine section for 2022, you'll see a long list of very well-known companies and they've all been hit with massive fines, 10 million, 100 million, 200 million, massive, massive fines. They put money aside knowing they're gonna get fined, right? So it's just that they expect to get fined. It's just, a, it's just a part of their business plan. So we knew that there was huge commercial uh, benefit in, in, in our technology, um, but you know, the tech that we create, yes, it's going to help these guys um, avoid fines, but it can also help protect uh, vulnerable members of society. It can protect children. Um, I have young children, right? And uh, as I said before, it's very hard to keep on top of like where tech is going these days. And yeah. you, you just don't know what your children uh, are exposed to. We have technology that we've built and it's up and running and it's working, right? It's a rocket phone SIM card. You put that SIM card in your phone today, you make and receive calls as normal, right? but we have an AI listening to the conversations, not snooping, but selectively listen to conversations that might be, that might carry risk. Okay. Unique issues. Exactly, yeah. So if my daughter's having a conversation with somebody and, you know, and, and th th there are things in that conversation um, that are unsuitable or, or that might present risk in, in some shape or form, um, that might present danger to my child, our system will notify um, me of that. I'll get an SMS, your daughter's in a conversation, Here's a recording, if you want the recording. Very entirely up to the parent. Uh, but we have that technology today, right? 
Um, elderly person having a conversation being missold to, we can stop that and it strikes. Um, banks, sales organizations, selling to people, um, sometimes turning a blind eye to the fact that this person might be vulnerable or might be, yeah. um, you know, we can stop that and it strikes. And, and we don't want that. Our software is, um, it, it's, it, it could be perceived to be expensive, uh, but that's because banks are willing to pay that. Because if they're saving um, on fines of a half a billion dollars, yeah they'll happily pay us $10 million for our software, right? So it's a basic business value equation. You can't charge that to consumers and to individuals, right? Or to charities. So, so I reached out to, um, there's a charity in the, in the UK called Age Concern. Uh, sorry, Age UK, they used to be called Age yeah. Concern. Yeah. And, uh, and I said to those guys, you know, we have this tech, um, let's, let's talk about just giving it to you, right? So, and, and, and the question that I got asked was, well, how are you gonna fund that? Um, I said, our commercial um, relationships will fund that. So we can sell it to the banks mm. um, and we can take um, a portion of that revenue and we can put that into our foundation um, and that pot can then fund um, projects that have Some charities. Yeah, diff yeah. yeah so societal uh, outcomes that are beneficial to individuals and vulnerable people, children and, and so on. So th 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 that is, a, like, th the foundation is really fundamental to what we do mm. and, and that's, we will be remembered for that we will not necessarily remember for walking away with tons of money because that happens every day, right? But if we've managed to make someone's life um, less risky, yeah. less danger prone, and we've managed to help them skirt and avoid danger, that is, that as an outcome, you know, for me, carries way more yeah. weight and value than selling a bunch of li software licenses to a, to a commercial entity. In, in itself, just knowing that you're, you're yeah. helping people. Yeah. So exactly. let's go from that and sort of, can you, paint a picture of the future that you envision with the widespread adoption of ethical voice AI solutions like Rocketbone? Yeah, it, it's, uh, it, it's really, really hard to predict beyond the next six of months. Of course, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think the role of um, voice processing is gonna be huge going forward. Um, so if, if we sort of fast forward and think, okay, we've got this technology platform that is capable of doing, th we do three things really well. We ingest conversations wherever they happen. So in, in a business context, those conversations are uh, phone calls from your desk phone. It can be cell phone calls from your mobile. Um, it can be Zoom calls, Teams calls, Google Hangouts, all those conversations, WhatsApp calls. You know, all those are business conversations that you're having and we're extracting um, things that are interesting and useful from those conversations. Um, and then we uh, kick off actions off the back of that. So it's great for companies like Virgin Media, for example, because they've grown up through acquisition over the years. They've got a broadband division, a TV division, a fixed line division, and, and lots of different divisions. Uh, but if you call the broadband team and you say to them, um, I, I fancy watching the footy tonight, they won't sell you a football package because that's a broadband team, because the football package is sold by the TV team. They're in a different room, a different department. Um, but Virgin's just lost out on some revenue there, right? Um, so, so the, the, and our technology can just pick up on that and generate the lead and the opportunity for the other department. So if you extrapolate that and you think, well, where else could we take this technology, right? The, 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 there is l l no limit to, to where you could apply this. I was having a conversation. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a closet gamer, right? So, so when I do have a little bit of downtime, uh, I, I try to sort of fire up, you know, Need for Speed, Grand Theft Auto, whatever it might be, right? You know, and, and I, you know, World of Warcraft, Command and Conquer, you name it, I, I, I play it all if I can. Um, but all these games exist in this thing called the metaverse. I think you know Mark Zuckerberg came up with the term, right? And I'm not sure how well he's doing with it, but the fact of the matter is uh, these online um, social um, uh, environments exist, right? So if you play World of Warcraft, you're playing with hundreds of people from around the world. If, if you're playing you know, Call of Duty, you're like, you know, playing with hundreds of people from around the world, right? So you exist in this uh, sort of virtual space and you can call it the metaverse, you can just call it an online gaming community. Um, but you know we have technology that can you know you have uh, your, your headset attached to your to your headphones and, you, yeah. and you're saying i'm coming around the corner i'm going to come and get you whatever and then somebody else says yeah yeah but you know what i'm, I'm really hungry i could do with some food i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna knock off for a second like we can hear that that's an indication that this person's hungry he turns a corner there's a pizza hut in the game right and there's like a 25 percent discount offer he walks into pizza hut uh, his screen changes he's ordering pizza and he gets delivered out into the real world right Wow. And then it carries on gaming. Yeah. And we can do that because we have this engine that can detect conversations, you know, detect interesting topics that are being discussed, and then do something with that information as, as the conversation is flowing. So, um, you know, our sort of, sort of MO is to, um, I said we ingest conversations wherever they occur. 
our MO is just to expand the number of places that we can listen to conversations on because, yeah. you know, from a commercial point of view, there's a huge amount of value, right? Untapped value in, 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 in business conversations. But it, even in the consumer space, there's a huge amount of untapped value um, from the point of view of pre protecting consumers, uh, but also the example that I just used, uh, order pizza when somebody says they're hungry, right? Um, that's as far forward as I can think right now. Yeah. Um, and the immediate task at hand for us is to make sure that we get the customers that we're targeting right now and, and get those guys successful. I mean, so this next question is going to be a bit of a challenge for you then. With how fast AI is moving, where do you see yourself in five to ten years? Oh, blimey. Um, I probably won't be here with you physically. <laughs> I, I, I'll be strapped Don't to say a, that. I, I'll, I'll be strapped to like wires and pipes and machines somewhere, <laughs> right? And I'll have like a brain interface. <laughs> I, I won't leave my bedroom. Uh, I'll get fed by IV tube. I'm, I'm honestly, I'm, I joke about that, Ram. I'm genuinely worried about it. Um, so, so the, tell my me son, what. Tell me what, what are your thoughts on this. I'm, I'm worried about the disengagement of society and, uh, and, and where we are um, as a species, uh, to be honest. I mean, what COVID, I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't go out anymore, right? When I, when I go down the local pubs or clubs, they're all dead. Yeah. I think the whole notion of like going out, meeting people to have fun, is just kind of died there. I think it's definitely changed since yeah. COVID. I mean, it's definitely not the same yeah. as it used to be. I mean, you know, going to my sort of uni experience, my first year was hit by COVID. Really? And then yeah. I went back, it was never the same. Yeah. It was, yeah, it's quite strange. So th th that then turns us into sort of home by, homebound recluses. Um, see, my daughter, my daughter's 16. And um, she's on the phone all the time. She's on with a friend, Snap, WhatsApp, whatever the whatever the app is at the time. I think to myself, on, on the one hand, it's good because when I was a 16 year old, I was a bit of a tear away. I was out with my mates all the time. Parents never knew what time I was gonna, I was going to get back in. Sometimes I'd come in at four in the morning, five in the morning on a Friday, Saturday night. And my dad would be there waiting for me, you know, ready to yeah. give me a good old telling off. Yeah. My daughter doesn't do that, and I'm quite pleased that she's not out and about the whole night. But at the same time, she's not socialising in quite the way that we used to socialise. Yeah. And so human connection seems to be um, moving away from sort of like face-to-face, in-person, social engagement to let's just do it all online, right? I can't, I can't phone my daughter, I have to text her. Um, and all this stuff, you know, the post-COVID notion of not going out, people turn to their devices more and more and more. Um, you know, the more interfaces that we have as an alternative to human conversation, the more reclusive people will become. And I think for us, you know, we're kind of in the middle of all this. I think for the next generation, they're gonna grow up in this world of everything, you just sit and do everything from your living room. Yeah. Don't leave your bedroom. Um, I mean, COVID almost proved that you could not go to school. You could just learn on Teams and have remote classrooms. And th there's benefit to that because, you know, I think from an environmental perspective, it's great. You're not burning carbon every five seconds a day trying to get places. I think that's good. The tube is not packed all the time anymore. That's good. Um, fewer cars in the road. That's, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Um, but we've got to be careful that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And, and so when I think about the next 10 years, I think, honestly, companies like ours um, who are on that growth path um, and who actually have quite a bit of influence over this, right? It, our technology it is going to be the stuff that kind of drives human behavior. And, and so it behooves us to think about the impact that we can have there and, and what are the consequences. It's all well and good creating some sort of great AI feature or something and going to make a ton of money out of it but if you're going to harm society by by deploying it then you probably shouldn't um and this is actually professor michael waldridge you know being the chairman of the turing institute they spend a lot of time thinking about the ethics of ai um you know th th thinking about the um uh you know th th there's an area of uh, research um known as pause for, i'm trying to think of it now providence there's an area of research called um um, provenance uh, mapping and it's, uh, it's where has this piece of information come from you can watch a video today right of, of um, Donald Trump saying something and the next minute he's been like, taken away by the police and it's all fake it's a deep fake right and but it's really convincing it's his voice it's his image mm -hmm. and you know and you, sort of bad actors can use that to, to reprogram entire societies right and 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 so Michael is working on technology or with research teams that can trace back these things so that they can understand where it's come from. Has it come from a reliable source or has it not? And can we trust it? And, and, and uh, we've, got to fix, we've got to fix trust um, in, in this new world of AI. Yeah. And uh, it's going to be a, it's a real tough nut to crack, actually.
Well, yeah, let's go on to sort of safeguarding and mm -hmm. sort of how does Rocket Phone AI ensure the safeguarding of consumers and businesses in their communication systems? Yeah, um, so th th there's a, you know, there's a huge amount of opportunity um, to uh, misuse technology. Um, I, and I think this is going to be the problem with AI in general. I think people, when, when people express their fear of AI, they're, they're thinking about Terminator, you know, thinking about robots stomping down the high street, blowing everything up. It's not going to be that. Um, it's going to be something very different. Uh, people think about like AI is going to take everyone's jobs. Um, I don't think it's even going to be that. I, I think, you know, um, uh, people are generally fairly good at adapting. Um, Otherwise, we'd have no. We, we, otherwise, we'd have complete joblessness, right? Um, today, because thirty years ago, people said that computers are going to take all our jobs, and, and robots in factories are going to take all the manufacturing jobs. Those people just retrained, and they're doing other things now. So they're actually doing higher value work and more interesting work, rather than mundane work. Uh, so I'm, I'm not too worried about that. I think people will adapt and change that. What I am worried about is um, AI being used um, to misinform people, um, to mislead people, um, and, and, and to almost cheat them out of what, what is rightfully theirs. And it's, it's, it's going to become so sophisticated. We have technology, a rocket phone, right? We haven't commercialized it. Um, but if you speak to our system for 15 minutes, we could say anything in your voice, yeah. right? So we, we could generate a phone call, call, call a member of your family and just speak as you. Use my voice. And use your voice, wow. right? And uh, how open to abuse is that? We haven't released that technology because um, we, it's a bit spooky, in my opinion. I agree. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, there, and there are huge implications uh, around, uh, you, you know, you, you call your bank and, and, and your voice is your password. Um, but if I mimic your voice, I can get into your account, right? So, mm -hmm. so, so the potential for huge, huge misuse is real and present. We haven't launched it because if we launch that technology, we need to find a way of building a fence around it so it's not misused. And, and, and where it's applied is for genuine legitimate purposes, right? And we haven't figured out a way of, of how to do that yet. And we'll launch that when we figure it out. Process. Yeah, yeah. And, and so everything that we've launched today, um, you know, I, I've spoken about the societal impact of what we do. Um, there is, um, you know, there is huge potential for AI to safeguard people, as I've described already, you know, protecting children, protecting the elderly, detecting mental health challenges, detecting age, you know, picking out possible um, attempts uh, at fraudulent activity. And, and, and that is really what we're about. That is the essence of what we do. Um, and we will, we will keep doing that. Um, I, it's almost like our role in the AI space is to be the good actor yeah. um, and, and to make sure that um, we are ready to safeguard people against bad actors who were deploying uh, abuse of AI. Yeah, of course. Well, look, it's been great hearing about the journey, the mission, the vision. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks.